Our next speaker, we're going to start out with some information related to the cow now. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Larry Chase. He's a professor emeritus of the Dairy Cattle Nutrition in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell. And for over 20 years, he's been part of the team developing and, in, and implementing precision feed management programs on New York dairy. So Thanks, Becky. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And uh, Matt gave you a uh, good overview, and we're going to keep moving and go a little bit more detail, I guess. So basically, as, in, as Matt indicated, this is part of the USDA NEFA situation. That's the acknowledgement thing. Matt gave you a good overview that the industry committed in 2009 to lower greenhouse gas emissions 25% by 2020. And one of the questions we have to think about, and that's the whole supply chain. It's not just the farm, it's the whole supply chain. So where are the big pieces in this puzzle to attack? And if you look at this, was put together by the uh, Innovation Center U.S. Dairy, if you look at the carbon footprint of the dairy system, then you go to percent of the total, you can see that they go the whole chain, but at the end of the day, milk production and the other associated things, crops and the manure, about 72% of the total sits at the dairy farm. And so that's why I think there is a lot of interest in this type of project. Because, you, you know, these, these areas with 3 or 4% are important, but you don't have a lot of opportunity to shift it a whole lot by changing those. And so I think uh, that's why this project is zeroing in on this 72%, which is how we can potentially hope to reduce that. Okay. So how do we lower it? Well. When they do carbon footprint, uh, LCAs and carbon footprints, they usually use CO2 emissions per unit of product, like in this case, grams per unit of milk. And if you look at some of the key opportunities, <coughs> we can just increase milk per cow. And you'll see later that as you increase milk per cow, grams per pound go down. Digestible feeds make cows more efficient, convert more pounds of milk per pound of feed, and decrease the number of non-productive days. Those are just a couple big items. For example, the more cows and heifers on the farm that stand around that eat feed that don't make milk, reduce that number. So if we can reduce non-productive days, it will help. One of the things that, that I think we need to think about and look at when we report data, I mean, this is my bias, as I said, we, we report it as grams per pound or liter of milk or whatever. And in this case, we took one ration, put it through the model that we use, our, our animal model, at different levels of milk production to say, what is the impact of level of milk production? So we went from about 40 pounds of milk to 120. And you can see there's a nice decrease as you increase milk production in the emissions of an expressive per per unit of milk produced. However, if you look at it in terms of the actual grams per day emitted to the environment, it goes the other way. And that makes sense. This cow is eating a lot more feed, the rumen's working harder, they're processing more material, so there will be more emissions. So again, I think, my, my thought is maybe we should be reporting both, both ways instead of just one, but that's for discussion. Okay. So we've done <clears throat> some things, one of the things we did, and the gentleman over here asked about measurement and the, the people in Wisconsin are doing the measurement. And we said, well, we're gonna take the other approach. We're gonna go and look at literature data and farm data and see what comes out of that and then match it with the measured data as we go. So initially what we did is we put together a database right now with the one we're talking about today is 199 rations from commercial dairy herds that we ran them through our, our, the animal model. And we're just, right now, just looking at simple correlations. There'll be a lot more work, and we've actually expanded the data set to uh, almost 300 herds right now. What can we find when we look at these data sets? And how do they fit with some of the other information we have? So this is just uh, a couple points. If you look at dry matter intake, as that goes up, the emissions per pound of milk go down. 
However, if you look at dry matter intake as it goes up, emissions in grams go up significantly. And so again, if you're looking at this, there's 0.79. That's a simple correlation, obviously. That's one of the big drivers. Intake alone will answer a lot of the questions. If we look at the fiber, neutral detergent fiber, which is a measure of fiber it feeds, again, as we change that, it has a negative impact on grams per pound of milk. So as you increase the NDF or decrease it, it goes down. However, in terms of total grams, it goes the other way. Because it can be processing more feed. Starch is another one of the carbohydrates. <coughs> Gram per pound of milk to increase starch, it tends to drive down emissions per pound of milk. It increases them in total grams slightly. And then this total amount of forage fed. Again, as that goes up, we tend to drive down a little bit the grams per pound of milk it goes up in terms of total. There's a lot more in there that we can pull out, but those are just some examples of how we can say, well, you know, what are the big things we should look at? Well, it looks like fermentable carbohydrates, dry matter intake, are big ones that we need to look at as we move ahead to have impact on the animal side. There have been a number of review papers lately. You know, this is by Dr. Joanne Knapp, uh, 2014. And she tried to say, given the literature data she could assemble at that time and breaking it apart, what are the potential maximum reductions you could get in methane per unit of energy corrected milk? She attributed genetic selection using genomics and so on. Maybe that is an opportunity to decrease emissions 18%. Feeding and nutrition, around 15%. Rumen modifiers, there are a number of compounds we can use that are experimental that can change the rumen environment and reduce the uh, emissions. She gave it 5%. Since that time, there's been some additional work saying that this 5% may be conservative. There's one trial uh, from Dr. Vistoff at Penn State uh, with one specific product that had a 25 to 30% reduction with the modifier. Other management strategies have heifers calved earlier, um, improve reproductive performance around 18%. She said if you add them all together, maybe 30%, because they're not assumed to be additive. So, you know, she said only about 30%, so that would get us right on target with the reductions that being requested. She went a little bit further and just pulled out a few things where she said intake, if we increase dry matter intake, feed intake, we decrease the emissions about 2 to 6% percent <coughs> 2.2 pounds increase in intake. So we see that has an impact. Particle size didn't matter much in terms of is it a long particle or a small particle. Process grain to make it more digestible. We make the grain more digestible. It decreases the emissions. If we lower room pH to less than 5.5, that's the big one. Now the problem with that is if you do that, you have a dead cow. So it probably isn't too practical. Okay. <laughs> But if you can lower room and pH, you can really knock emissions. But it's not one, one that should recommend. Be practical. Feed more grain. Again, if we increase the amount of uh, starch and sugar, non-fiber carbohydrates, so move those up, we get a slight decrease in the emissions per unit of milk produced. <coughs> Just three more, and then we'll be out of this one. Forage quality. People talk about forage quality forever. If we can improve forage digestibility, fiber digestibility, we lower the emissions methane per unit of milk produced. Forage type and selection, whether you use corn salad, alfalfa, grass, has a potential impact. Some of these are uh, a little bit more efficient in terms of that emissions grams per pound of milk. In fat feeding, we had some additional energy. We can lower that about 
you can see about 5% for each unit of fat. So there becomes a limit where at some level the fat depresses milk production and feed intake also. So all of these have to be weighed, put together, but they give us indexes of which pieces of the puzzle to attack. Another one, just an example, if we can do a better job of reproductive performance, have cows conceive better, have a higher conception rate, pregnancy rate, some work by Garth in England a few years ago showed that if we can uh, improve pregnancy rate from 19% to 25%, you can get 4 to 11% reduction per 100 cows in methane emissions. So that's a management factor. Also had an impact on pneumonia. There's a lot of other things that we can look at that also give us chances to alter this. We can look at the frequency of milking, two times, three times, four times a day. Uh, we talked about reproduction, uh, what might somatotropin, grouping, healthy animal, transition. All of these are things at the dairy farm that we have opportunities in all of those areas to have some degree of lowering and changing emissions per unit of milk produced. So it's not just how we feed the cow, it's the total package. We have opportunities to look at many of these as we do this. So to wrap this up, I think we have to look, I look at this in two different ways. Long term, what's going what's to take three to five years? Well, genomics and genetic selection to improve feed efficiency. That's a, it's out there, but it's a long term tool. It's not very useful today, but three, four, five, six years, maybe it will be. There are people looking at ways to alter the microbial population of the rumen. That may or may not work because the rumen bugs seem to be smart enough to figure out if you make a change, they adapt. But there's still people looking and may be something there, but that's long term. Added compounds like the one that Alex used that can alter rumen fermentation. The reason it's long term is in any of these, if they ever going to be used, have to go through FDA. And that's a long-term process. And altering herd management. If you're going to change the program and have heifers camp earlier, it's, it's a two, three-year project. Short-term approaches, if we can improve feed efficiency so that we get more units of milk per unit of feed, that's, a, that's one we can do pretty quick on a farm. That will have an impact. Using fiber and starch digestibility, better balance rations, fine tune. We can do that today, that helps. Uh, you, there are some feed additives that might be out there that could be used based on data, and forage type and forage quality. These are all the things that people have been working on for years in dairy farms. So it basically says continue what we've been doing, just improve it, and it gives us opportunities. Providing feeding and management systems that improve cow comfort, Herd health, reproductive performance. A good, healthy, comfortable cow, in addition to changing some of the nutrition on the farm. And then precision feeding and consistency of feed mixing, delivery, and feed bump management. So it's a factor that we can change the starch level and have some impact, yes, but at the farm level we have a lot of other things we can put in that help with that package. So thank you for your time. Let's see if you have any questions. So uh, I have some. So Larry, you put all of these strategies up there. Do you think a few are like the ones we should be targeting as we move forward? That's why we're doing the, the uh, sorting through the, with the database to see which are the two or three big ones. And it looks like the feed efficiency, digestible feeds, and forage quality are going to win the game. Shouldn't surprise anybody. They've won the game forever. And then some of these other strategies for herd management for longer will help us some, but the big ones are still going to be those, those key ones right there. Another question. Larry, is your thoughts on the high forage diet and just in the methane discussion, is it pro? We're running a lot, a lot of those through right now. And actually, I think as we get the better digestible forage, we can go to the higher forage diet and still have a reason. I think some of the reasons. Low quality forage is not. But the other thing, I think we have to balance it at some point in profitability. Uh, we 
had a session last week, uh, we had for 70% 40, I was 130 pounds a mill. And you're going to come in and you've got to do a good, you can't afford it. Right. You can do nothing. So I think there's some trade offs that we have to work from these things too. Did you look at all to the impacts of the, the building and the waste removal system? Yeah. Yeah. That's the components of the project you're looking at the manure aspects and that. But we did not have the animals on the Larry, are there things that match up in terms of wind, both economically for the farmer as well as the wind for the greenhouse gases? Well, I think we really think about nuclear fuel efficiency and that lowers greenhouse gas and gas and wind for the water. A better quality forage is going to be a thing for both. A better balance of the room and the environment. We can move away from the building of the inclination for So a lot of these, I think, are going to be much better for the farmer in terms of his uh, cost. So I think the south of the farmer may not be too bad for some of these. Joe. So the work that Alex and Kristoff's done at Penn State, yep. I can't remember the name of the compound. But Three the nitro oxypropanol. So it seemed to me that, that that single compound was like really effective compared to a lot of other things. It was about a 25-30% reduction, and it was a 12-week trial with cattle at about 100 pounds of milk. There's been a lot of things in vitro that show 75 to 80 percent reductions in methane. But in vivo, long term, this is the first one that shows any, any hope, I think. There may be others that come along. But again, before that ever gets to the marketplace, uh, you've got three, four, five years of more trials, more money. But it shows potential. That's why I have on the long term list.